Welcome everybody to our Juris Doctor Masterclass this evening, titled Humans or Bots? Should AI Generated Creations Be Patented? With a special guest speaker, Professor Nalufa Salvadurai from the Macquarie Law School. Thank you very much, Andrew. As Andrew said, hello everyone. It's lovely to be with you this evening. As Andrew said, I'm Nalufa Salvadurai and I'm from the Macquarie Law School. And I'll just share my slides. Can everyone see that? Yeah, fantastic. Please do interrupt me anytime to ask questions. As Andrew said, we really want this to be an interactive session. And it's very much the way we teach law at the law school, at the Macquarie Law School. We want to make sure that the content is engaging and that it connects to your interests, uh, any questions you may have. So please just interrupt me. Don't even put that little hand sign on because I may not see it. Just interrupt and just talk up and I'll stop and we can talk about any issues that are of interest to you. And there's no such thing as a silly question or a silly comment. Everything is a learning opportunity. So please do talk and make it, you know, everything that you need from it. Please make sure you get that from this session. So as Andrew mentioned, the topic is humans or bots. Should AI, that's artificial intelligence, generation creations be painted, patented? So let's start by talking about what artificial intelligence is. As you probably know, AI is the simulation of human intelligence processes by computer systems. And there are many different types of AI. There's what's called weak or automated learning systems. And these refers to processes by which AI systems apply mathematical formulas or clear rules to come up with a process or an outcome. Then an example of that is the Australian tax office. The ATO uses simple or what's called weak AI to work out how much tax you owe, any deductions, and it's very efficient and they can crunch lots of numbers really quickly. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what's called strong AI, which uh, sort of refers to automated systems that can reason. They can learn from experience, they can self-correct, and these are much more sophisticated. And a fun example is the Netflix recommendations feature you may be familiar with. So you may see that it constantly changes because depending on what you're watching, the system is learning from experience, learning from what you have selected in the past and coming up with not like final conclusions, but sort of suggestions and speculations. So it's quite sophisticated because it's not applying rules, it's actually speculating. So it's a little bit more nuanced. And there are lots of examples. I just mentioned two others. You may have heard of Apple's Garage Band, which is a real cool, uh, really cool music app that uses AI to generate music. Um, then you've got AI systems that generate art. This is called Ta Tokyo Art Generator, this on the screen. And it, what it does is it takes photographs and it generates paintings uh, in the style of an artist you can choose. So you can choose Picasso or Degas and it'll generate a painting of you from your photo. So those are just two examples, but there's less glamorous applications of AI too, uh, such as banks use it to assess mortgage and loan applications, uh, manufacturing supply chains use them to you know, audit stock and see what has to be sent to where. Uh, New South Wales transport system uses it to schedule trains and uh, work out which train should go when. National Defence uses it in drones and all sorts of things. So there's a huge amount of different uh, applications. But one of the things all of this AI is doing is it's questioning the whole concept of what is creativity and what's inventive. Because the AI systems we're talking about, some of them are sort of generating outputs which are pretty creative, pretty original, pretty inventive. And so there's whole concepts in what we call the intellectual property law, which is premised on human creativity is being challenged by machines. So here comes our first interactive question. Um, and I'll just introduce it and then we'll round the poll. So a big question, and we will look at this in our law, technology law options, but also it connects to a lot of other areas too. And it is, do you think AI systems, robots can ever be considered creative? Can they replicate human imagination? So this is not just a legal question, it's like this whole sociological question as well. And I thought we'll get everybody's views. I've got three options. So you can say, yes, totally agree. 
technology can generate creative options. I'm really on board with the machine creativity thing. Or you can say maybe perhaps in some situations, or you can say absolutely no, humanity cannot be replicated. Robots can never replicate human imagination. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little quiz that you can do, a survey that you can do, and we'll give you a few minutes. Here it is, a few second minutes to do it. And then when you've done it, we'll maybe discuss it. And if you feel like, you know, giving your reasons for what you, why you said it, I'd love to hear what you thought. So here we go. Ah, so everyone's being really, really thoughtful and going for this middle. <laughs> Very interesting. So we've got a spectrum equal, almost equal with yes and no, and with a lot of people in the middle. While we're just waiting for, you know, the final results to come up, does anyone want to just unmute themselves and tell me or tell everyone why you said what you did? Maybe someone who said yes. Does anyone want to, don't feel pressured, but you know, if you feel like sharing why, why you think yes. Yeah, that's okay. Anyone for no? How about, How about Bronwyn? Yeah, hi. I don't know if you can see me. I can't see everyone, but uh, yeah. um, I think uh, yes, because humans are creative. And so if we can generate those ideas in um, AI, I can't see why the world isn't limitless, that um, creativity can exist. Um, so yeah, I, don't th I, I definitely think yes. Fantastic. Absolutely. And it's a very sort of flexible, future oriented thinking. So very interesting. Anyone want to say no? Because I'm actually surprised that there's 21% of noers as well. So I'd, I'd love to say no. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Yeah. Hi, my perspective is that the works of robots and AI are derivatives of the creation of the robot and the AI, uh, which is where the human creativity ends. And therefore, the machines are just following instructions that were written by humans. So they're derivatives, not creations. Great, good. Some two very, very diametrically opposed clear views. Fantastic. Anyone want to be in the middle? <laughs> uh, yes, if I can. Hi, Alex. Uh, hi, so yeah, I actually sent a message and a very interesting point that Mark just made. And I'm, uh, I'm kind of between the two was kind of, I would lean to his point, but I think you tricked us all. <laughs> though, you did, though you did say that it kind of both legal and I think I think a philosophical question, but I think just your question what it does, it highlights that there is no such thing as simple things in life, for better or for worse. <laughs> and it really comes down to how each of us defines what means to be creative. So in that sense, I would say there is no right or wrong answer. And I think Mark is right, and I think um, I think it was Bronwyn. Bronwyn is right, and what we hear here, what we see here, is just different perspectives on the same issue. And I think that's where maybe it, uh, my answer would come about whether robots can be creative or not. Because, well, here we see what maybe robots. I would want to see robots to replicate that, mm -hmm. namely the diversity in human opinions on the things which you would think before we start uh, answering, providing answers, you would think, well, what's so difficult about this question? But, well, there is a whole lot of meaning actually in here. And the deeper you dig, the more meaning you find out. So absolutely. Thank you very much, Alex. So that was very interesting. So as they, as Alex, Mark and Bronwyn have sort of pointed, there is a spectrum. So there's one position where you can say it's actually the human programmer or who designed the algorithm that drives the AI, they should be attributed with the creative output. Then on the other extreme, you can say, no, it's the AI system itself which generates it. Or you could even have people who are involved like creating the training data sets that trains the AI system. Maybe they should have a role in being attributed. So there's a whole spectrum. So it's really good to see that sort of discussion. And we're gonna talk a little bit more of a lot of these issues. And I noticed what you said about diversity, so important. And you might've heard of what's called algorithmic bias. I'm going off script a bit, but it's such an important point. Algorithmic bias is where the system, the AI system has 
a, a very limited number of assumptions. So for example, a really good example is in Chicago, they were using AI for loan applications and they were trying to work out risks and they had worked out that particular postcodes were associated with loan defaults and that the, the system learned itself to then discriminate against those postcodes. As it turned out, those postcodes were associated with particular racial groupings. And so there was this sort of maybe unintentional racial bias that kind of came through a system. So inclusion and diversity is a big challenge if we're going with this process. So great, I think we got all we wanted from there. So what I'll do is I close it up. We'll keep going and we'll keep developing some of these ideas that we've raised, really interesting. Now, I don't know if you can see this, it's a bit on the corner, oops. But what it is, is a, uh, picture of a monkey. Now, it's a little bit different. So what it is, is before we go deeper into machines, I thought we'll talk a little bit about animals because we have a really good case. And it's a real case that went to the High Court of the United Kingdom, where a monkey took a selfie. So the monkey, who is a celebrity's crested marquee, used equipment which belonged to a British nature photographer called David Slater. He just picked up the camera, the monkey, and took a selfie of himself. So the question was, can he own copyright? Can this creative output of a photograph be attributed to the monkey? If you and I took a photograph, we'd have copyright in it as humans. But could the monkey have copyright? What do you think? Do you think the court said the monkey had copyright? Can you want to guess? The court said no. Yeah. Yeah. Monkey can't be creative, which is a bit, yeah. I think, a bit disrespectful because it looks really good, don't you think? He's really smiling. I think he might even have been watching someone take selfies and he's he's have sort of replicated it. But no, monkeys, animals cannot be creative, no copyright for them. So it's a bit of an interesting parallel now that we're talking about machines and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So which brings us to the question we're looking at with should AI generated inventions be granted patent protection? And as has come out of that discussion around the first question, there are various dimensions as was pointed out. There's the legal one, which we're focusing on. But there's also the economic one and philosophical one and also lots of other dimensions. And at Macquarie Law School, we really do try to put law in context. We're quite known for that. And the good thing for JD students is that you can use all that knowledge and expertise that you have from your first degree or your first area, you can integrate it with law because we are really open to that. And when I teach, I really love to hear what my students have done in their first degree, if they combine law or JD and try to connect it because it's a point of entry to law. So if you've done arts, you might come, come at it from a you know, sociological or anthropological dimension. If you've done economics, you might be talking about commercial opportunity. If you've done um, philosophy, you might be coming from another angle. So the JD is really good in that way because it can integrate what you know with law. And what you get is a real generation of uh, new graduates who have holistic solutions to problems more and more the whole of industry is looking for people with that this holistic approach where they can integrate different disciplines to address prob real world problems. And so with the JD program, that is what we do. We come and we integrate your existing knowledge with law so that you've got this multifaceted understanding, which is really what employers are telling us is what they want from graduates, this multidisciplinary approach. They don't want just a lawyer or an economist. They want someone who can just give a solution. So in this situation, of course, the legal one, we'll look at the legal quest side. And the legal side is essentially looking at the patents law right now, which requires inventiveness and ownership by a human. We're looking at that and seeing how that works with machines. And we'll also look at a little bit about the economic dimension. Patents create monopolies, which are meant to promote innovation and progress. So the question is, is there an economic utility in giving such protection to AI systems or the companies who own them? Uh, what if we don't give that protection? Will that deter research and development because people don't want to invest in it because they can't get a monopoly? So that's the whole economic dimension, which we need to add. The philosophical dimension too is, you know, how, are we undermining humanity? Are we undermining the value of human beings if we start recognizing creativity in all sorts of non-human contexts? So that's all of those things. And we will look at this one at a time. 
Again, just stop me anytime if you want to talk, talk or comment. So the legal dimension, two things. Firstly, inventiveness. The law requires an inventive step. Now, this is actually not too hard for AI-generated inventions to satisfy. As we've seen, they're pretty clever, they're pretty original, and it has been sort of suggested in a variety of judgments that AI systems may be capable of satisfying inventiveness. So, but what do you think? We're still very much at, a, what's the word, a, a frontiers of knowledge here. So it's not settled. What, so what do you think? And this is our second question. Do you think AI generated inventions should be protected by patents? And so this is not just about whether they're inventive is, do you think for economic, legal, social, philosophical reasons, should we protect them? And so, yes, we've got a yes, maybe, and a no again. I should mention that a patent is essentially an exclusive right to, de to develop an invention for a set period of time. So while you, when you have a patent, other people can't use that technology without getting a license from you and paying you a money. Very interesting. So less people are saying no, it looks like. And maybe I wonder why, is it the economic reasoning that's driving that? So, Still changing, ooh, it's like the elections, the election nights going up and down. So still the middle ground is the most uh, popular space, but there are more yeses than last time. Does anyone who want to, who want, you know, want to give a reason for your answer? Yes, no, or maybe? <laughs> So I think the yeses are probably reflecting the economic reasoning that you do need to protect that otherwise we're not going to get much investment in AI technologies. Um, so that's probably I'm guessing what's going, giving that 35%. Uh, I'd be interested to say for why, but no, I mean, if you don't think that machines can be invented, yes, Alex. Uh, yes, I, on this one, I've, uh... Kind of bit the bullet and I actually took a stance and I, I think I can defend it. So I would be very curious to see if someone wants to kind of argue because I, I really wanted to find any applause. Uh, uh, for me, this one is much more clear cut than your first one. Right. And um, I will kind of send this reason, which that's kind of what where that's the ground from which I came to my answer. No, because I think here we've crossed the Rubicon in a sense that <laughs> Patents inherently belong to either humans or corporations, legal entities. And I think we're now getting into this very murky area. Effectively, we're trying to introduce a new legal entity. Mm. So well, who is the AI? To whom we then want to assign a legal right and ownership of a patent. And I think the way you describe yourself at the end of the day, what is it going to allow? And, and I think your question for me, it's an excellent question because it raises, it's a link. Law is not an abstract thing. Mm -hmm. It's actually closely related to the society and it affects society greatly. And what we're allowing, because who owns AI? Mm -hmm. It would be, it's, it's expensive technology. It is, to give you a hint. yes. Meaning you and I, ordinary people would never, for any practical purpose, own AI. Mm -hmm. So effectively, we're creating, we're creating an avenue only for very select few entities. And if we allow AI to own a patent, effectively, we're creating a new opportunity for a very small group of entities who are already in a highly privileged position economically. So let's just look at the purely economical aspect of uh, uh, patent ownership, because as you said, that effectively involves ripping uh, benefits, quite outsized benefits, economic benefits. So I would rather keep things very clear cut. So by restricting and by denying AI ownership to the uh, patent ownership to the AI, we want to clearly identify at the end of the day, who owns this AI program that want to claim to patent. 
It would be either corporate entity or it would be inventor. Yes. So let's well, keep things yeah. very clear cut and let's not go into very murky area because that's where we get in trouble. Yeah, you, know, you're, so you have preempted the next question because in answer, you have looked over to the next question and we're going to talk about it again. But very good. Thank you very much. Mark, Thank you, you had, were unmuted for a while. Were you thinking of saying? Uh, yeah, just sharing my, my vote was for no. And yeah. I see the risk of digital squatterism yeah. uh, of the 19th century, whereby land was allocated to the people that got there first Ooh. rather than the people capable of dealing with it. Yeah. Um, similar happened to domain names when the internet, www, went uh, prolific. Uh, we had uh, domain name squatterism uh, and the risk of stifling innovation by blocking access to ideas by an AI created patent, I think poses a greater risk to uh, the, the economic development than it does by securing the patent. Interesting. Very, very good point. Because, yeah, there is a narrative about economic support from patents, but there is a, also the other side that it actually can stifle. Very interesting. So we might move on. Thank you very much for that. And some of the issues are coming up again because I'm going to have an ownership question coming up later as well. Great, Nalitha. I'm just, uh, just going to share a couple of the comments that have come through the chat. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, Larry said, um, normally I would think no, because I think it all comes down to the programming behind the AI rather than the AI system itself. But I think there could be exceptions if it would make the system work more smoothly. I still don't believe AIs can be creative. Um, and there were, as I'll say, Sarah said, wouldn't the patent ultimately belong to the human behind the AI? And there were uh, a number of people who said, I actually, I agree with what Sarah has just said. Uh, right. And there were one or two people listening to the arguments and thinking, I might change my vote. So, yeah, I think there's some really good uh, points that have been put forward by, by, by different uh, participants. Sarah, that sounds good. Yes, yeah, so and that is the million dollar question too. Where does the you know, spectrum of attribution, where does it, you know, where do we say this is the creator like we do need for law? So let's keep going because some of these questions are going to be addressed in some of the bits of law that we're going to look at as we go through. So... There is this legal dimension at the moment in patents law, pretty well across the world, that a patent can only be granted to a person who is the inventor. And everywhere pretty well uh, around the world, person is a human. So that is our like, sort of rate limiting step right now. And there's a big law reform discourse about whether we want to change that. But right now, that's where we stand. A patent can only be granted to a person and a person is a human being. And the Acts Interpretation Act in Australia tells you a person is a human being. So now this is why, and the question is a little bit uh, blocked by some of the uh, pictures, I think. Uh, should an AI system be allowed to own a patent? Now we've sort of preempted this discussion a bit, but let's just go through the motions and just vote for the poll, uh, survey when it comes up. So this is really what Alex was talking about, you know, companies owning and and also what Mark was talking about, the squatting aspect, like like cyber squatting, AI squatting. So I think you made a really good case, Mark and Alex. I think everyone is going with the 63% no, which is more, I think, than is reflected in society. At the moment, like the, the popular voting or social view is usually quite evenly split. So we today <laughs> have a very strong no feeling. Does so, that mean I should you give you the address to send the million dollar check uh, that you mentioned? <laughs> yes. Good. So that's the legal dimension which we look at. Now I want to talk about something really exciting. I hope you think it's exciting. That's happening right now. And that is what's called the Davis litigation. Now, what's happened is that uh, Davis is an artificial intelligence system that created a food container and a beacon light. So it, you wouldn't think that a food container and a beacon light can shake the foundations of patent law, but that's what's happening right now. So I'll just explain a little bit of background. So you've got someone called uh, Professor Stephen Taylor, who, dis, who made or invented this particular AI system called Davis. It's got some really technical name I don't quite understand, but it's called Davis. And he calls it a creativity engine. And he said it's composed of neural networks. So he actually uh, likens it to a brain. He's created it, but he's placed it in motion. And now he says it can think for himself. 
And he says it's like a trainer and like a PhD student. He's trained this PhD student. He's given them the knowledge, but now this student is making its own inventions. And he says that if similar training was given to a human student, it would be the human student, not the trainer, who would satisfy the inventing inventorship criteria under patents law. But the problem is this is not a human student, this is an AI system. Now, the University of Surrey in England, where Stephen Tyler is, they filed patent applications all around the world as an experiment to test this, what we've been talking about, to test it in the cases in the courts. And uh, they said it's a test case to raise a awareness and effect change. They very much want AI systems to be able to hold patents. So what's happened? Australia. Australia has clearly said no to the patent application. They've said, interestingly, they've said it's inventive, it's pretty creative, but they said a human can only own a patent. Patent can only be owned by a human. So that is like a very firm position right now in the judiciary, in the courts. Of course, legislation can change that. And we have a law reform discourse underway on that right now. Now, what happened in around, so that's purely law. But everybody, including Stephen Taylor, is also considering the economic dimension. As you say, there's two sides. And what Stephen Taylor from the University of Surrey is saying that an absence of patent protection means AI generated inventions would enter the public domain once they're disclosed and that will deter R&D innovation and ultimately stifle progress and economic growth. So we've already talked about all of these uh, issues in some detail. And, uh, and then there's also the philosophical dimension uh, of creativity and whether this should be part of society's patent protection. So we've got the legal position clear, but the question is, are the economic, philosophical, sociological reasoning, is, is it gonna be sufficient to change the law as it stands? Now we've got the United Kingdom saying the same thing as Australia. They also <clears throat> refused it because they said it was you needed a human inventor. The European Union was too. The European Union is, takes a really philosophical, uh, the US is all about the commercial factors, but the European Union is very much into the autonomy of the individual and the dignity and nobility of the human mind and human imagination. So it's a little bit more sort of, you know, if you're an art student, it's actually that the reasoning of the court is a little bit more beautiful and sort of the enlightenment thinking. If you are a commerce student, read the US judgment because it's very much about the economics. So even though everyone has said essentially that you need a human uh, inventor, they have slightly different uh, views, but all of them pretty well agree that AI inventions, uh, AI generated inventions are creative. That seems to be common. But what's also common is that you need a human creator. They're not willing to, as you say, cross the Rubicon and go with the beyond human uh, inventions as is consistent with the monkey selfie. So all sorts of creativity, uh, nothing but human creations now are protected. So this is interesting because I think that the law is likely to change. I know that I, I'm surprised actually at the, the level of discomfort about it, but I think the law will change because there's a lot of economic pressure to change and the economic reasons to pr protect AI generated inventions, I predict will change the law in the next five years. And the other thing is that the legal limitations relate to ownership, not inventiveness. Ownership can just be changed by a few words changed in the Acts Interpretation Act easily changed. If it was all about the concept of inventiveness, which is like hundreds of years, well, maybe tens of years of case law, it would be a bit messier. Now, we had a similar situation, and most of you may not have been born then, but in the 1980s, uh, we had a similar sort of moment in time where computer programs burst onto the screen, onto the uh, sort of the social consciousness, and there was a question of whether computer programs could be protected by copyright as literary works. And at the time, a lot of people said, oh, literary works, you know, that's Shakespeare, that's Tolstoy, you need these high level concepts, you need these, uh, you know, new frontiers of thinking. And they were saying a lot of things which sounded enlightened at the time. But then, you know, two or three years later, in the 90s, co computer programs were protected as 
literary works and that's where we are now and nobody even thinks that you would not have copyright protection for computer programs. I know this is different because this is a one step more because you've got AI generated inventions itself being the creator. So yes, it's further down the line, but it is possible and you can mark this time because you were there at the beginning of this conversation uh, that it's likely that the law will change. And what we learn from looking at the history of technology law is that the law takes time to catch up but eventually it does, and it is sort of driven by economic considerations and has been pointed out probably by powerful lobby groups, uh, powerful economic sort of um, uh, entities who are established. Alex. Oh, sorry, I'm just yeah. taking on your word that we can interrupt you, but um, uh, yeah. yes, I, I'll be honest, I feel very, unsettled by the future that you described. And I can see your reasoning. I, I follow you absolutely 100%, but I think that's why it so disturbs me because, uh, and I'm kind of, don't want to spoil a very nice environment here, but we're just watching right now what's happening in this big tech, uh, you know, issues like we just had the whole Australian government versus Google slash Facebook thing. And I think what you're bringing up, and I think you've actually, put your finger right to the point. At the end of the day, this whole thing is not about philosophy, about the, whether what we decide creative or not. At the end of the day, it's all about dollars, okay. to put it very bluntly. And I think at least you, you are very honest, like in terms of, like you said, it would be the economic interest that will decide. And, and that's what really scares me because I agree with you. And I think that is a very disturbing development in the modern age over the last 10, 15 years, because we see now law in, in, in the fundamental kind of principles are, are buckling in and, and being defeated by sheer power of dollars, so to speak, right? And it's almost like the economic interest now driving a lot of things outside of the economy. And um, for me, it's, and I think that the coming to the point that, but that the University of Surrey, to be honest, I actually started both business and I actually studied the, I had a degree in a computer science as well and actually did the, in, a, in, a, in a AI. So I, I do know what happens behind the scenes yeah, and yeah. I think I know what, how the system works. But my point is we have to realize it's, it's real life. University of Saturn made a very smart marketing move. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, you know, it's, and to be honest at this stage, this is nothing but excellent, brilliant marketing move. I mean, they went and they just come with this thing. We, we're going to launch patent applications and it worked. Mm -hmm. uh, my point being is just at this stage, we see a lot of, uh, you know, distractions. So we've been, we're being distracted where the driving thing is very banal and very trivial. It's economic interest. It's about having exclusive rights for very monopolistic profits. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's very interesting because actually it, uh, my just referred to Professor Paul Romer and the reason I'm bringing it completely different is that because Paul Romer used to be a very strong advocate of market philosophy that let the markets drive the everything and solve everything. Now he changed his uh, view. And the reason I'm bringing that thing is in a way that, you know, yes, we shouldn't be over fascinated by the allure of what's been presented to us because a lot of it just packaging. Yeah. We but have to see behind it. Sorry. Yeah. And I think my concern is that that we are, step, uh, we are stepping on a very murky road mm. where, yeah, the first steps may be glamorous and, and you know, mind blowing, but we, we should be very careful about where this road will lead us. Lead us. Yeah. Apologies. No, good point. Good point. Let me just give you like now something else to consider in terms of power, economic power. So what we have is Google and Facebook are power, but what they've replaced is let's say, and this is just, you know, one opinion, the Murdoch power. So you know, before we had Google and Facebook, we had Murdoch and all his newspapers, and that was incredibly powerful too. And maybe before that, we had Henry Ford. So we've had these power structures and Google and Facebook, in a way, there's another facet in that they have given a voice to a lot of people who never had it. So in the media in the 1990s, you just had one or two views from powerful media entities. Now, anyone can express their views, however crazy, but there's been a democrat democratization uh, and a bit of an empowerment of individuals. So 
what I'm just saying is, and we, I won't talk about this any further because I think there probably people are not that interested in one small area, but there have been, you know, what happens is one power structure replaces another. So you've got media and Rupert Murdoch, you know, working very strongly against Google and Facebook and Google and Facebook are powerful, but so was the power structure that replaced them. So, yeah, so we won't talk any more about it, but it's a very interesting area. And uh, yeah, so I see it in terms of moving power bases. And at the moment it's Google and Facebook, but you know, with AI, it could be an AI owned, a company that owns AI. They could be the next power structure on the horizon. So very interesting. So what I wanna do now, Andrew, are there any more questions in the chat room that we I haven't looked at? Let me just have a look. I haven't been following it because I've been just, uh, can you see any more that we haven't, any questions? Are there any questions from people we haven't heard from as well? I know there are 40 people. So please, um, you know, if we haven't heard your voice, just um, shout out. Sarah, did you want to say something? You had a very interesting comment and a lot of people were supporting that. No need to. I mean, even in our teaching at the law school, it's all very much about what your comfort level. If you want to talk, that's great. But if you don't want to, you can, you know, think about it. And, and I should mention that, you know, often it's the writing that gets you across the line as well. So even if you are you know, not someone who wants to talk and express your opinion, don't say law is not for me because you watch uh, American dramas and you think lawyers have to be strutting around talking, but actually, uh, good lawyers are good writers. So, you know, if you're into writing and reading, well, then law is for you. And even for law firms, they really, bread and butter law is reading and writing. So, you know, if you're interested in reading and writing um, in any context, you will do well in law, you'll enjoy law. So okay. let me go to, yeah. Nareka, there's a question that's come through from Jasmine. And Jasmine asks, what if all those car factory robots, the ones assembling cars, what if they have some inventive actions or process? Will the companies own the patent? Very interesting, very interesting. So that is about delegation. So if you have, just in general patent law right now, if your employer, uh, sorry, employee, uh, creates an invention within their course of employment, then the employer owns the patent. If they're an independent contractor, then the independent contractor would. So the robots, I would guess, would be employees. So they, if they create something, then the employer would be the, the, would be the owner of it. So very good. But if we say then that, um, so even if, even if robots were able to own it, the employer would be. But then you could have, if they're independent contractors, like, you know, if you got someone licensed something, then that light, if they were not an employee, but in some other relationship, then they could own the invention. Very interesting. Um, I have a point I'd like to yeah. raise. Yeah, On Sarah's point, and I've been thinking about this the whole time this discussion has yeah. taken place. Yeah. Uh, if it's artificial intelligence generated invention, surely that invention comes back to a human that has programmed the artificial intelligence. So why wouldn't the um, patent go back to that original human uh, if whether or not he works for a macro company? Yeah, <laughs> very good question. So that is a big legal issue as to where the weight of inventiveness lies. So Stephen Taylor from the University of Surrey, he was arguing that he had created this neural network, but he had programmed it such that it was then able to make decisions. So he was saying what he had done was he might have AI in the actual Davis, the system. But when the system then goes and does new creations, those outputs are owned by a the Davis, if that makes sense. So Stephen Taylor has a patent over Davis. But then Davis creates all sorts of beacons and lights and all sorts of things. And those beacons and lights and food containers, the patents for those, that IP, it belongs to Davis. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's the argument anyway. <laughs> that's the argument. Yeah, but it I know what sense. I don't necessarily agree with it, but yeah, it does make yeah. sense. Good, yeah. Simple thing yeah. is like, what about the program which is written by AI? Okay, the first level program when the program itself was written by human, it's very clear. 
Yeah. But then, exactly. very easy to picture. Now you have that AI itself writing a program. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's where the question is. Yeah, very good. So, uh, any other questions, comments? My microphone works. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um. So I'm a legal studies teacher in high school, and we're currently looking at the role of law reform in addressing emerging technological issues and enforcing the rights. How would this actually affect the right of the individual in wanting to apply for a patent or if the AI applies for a patent themselves, if they get to that point of learning? <laughs> very good question. It's Adam, is it? Yeah. Good. So very good question. So that will have a situation of competing applications and we get that at the moment. So you might have two people who collaborated and then they'll be competing as to who actually had the inventive step. And so we have that situation between human and human, quite common. But of course, it'll be a whole new scenario where it's human and an AI system. And presumably the same principles will apply. So the court works out where the inventive step lies and looking at causation and so on, where the uh, sort of weight of inventiveness lies. And then they'll work out who is the inventor. So presumably they would do the same, but they'll have to develop, as you say, some more nuanced and subtle principles to deal with that situation. But I guess it's foreseeable, it's conceivable that it's possible if the courts go down that, that route of saying, yeah, non-humans can own AI. Sorry, uh, non-humans can have patent protection for their works. Very good question. Uh, there's a comment here from Pablo who says, we already make algorithms created by AI. They are encrypted and very difficult to copy. I don't see the benefit from AI owning IP. Remember the rate of speed and development um, of AI is almost growing exponentially. So in a very short time, someone will own everything new. We already see this phenomenon. Interesting. So, I mean, what happens then if we give AIs, of course, it could start where it has been said that one, AI company owns it and then everyone will have to license it. It could increase costs and so on. So yes, that, that would be that would be a challenge. Very valid point. Professor Solodra, just on this point, yes. the game of chess is dead and the game of Go is dead. You know that? Yes. Because now yes. AI beats hands down the That's best right. chess. Yes. And especially in game of Go, which I think within the yes. area AI, that is was more shocking than you know, that AI which plays chess because Go is apparently recognized as the most difficult game to Interesting. Uh, handle. Hey, yeah, I know. I was going to mention that and I thought maybe it was too far away from the IP stuff, but yeah, the, an AI system has beaten the reigning world chess champion. Um, so, and I, didn't, I don't know exactly about the Go situation, but, but yeah. So, and that AI chess thing happened a few years ago. So, you know, they're probably even better now. <laughs> So, and yeah, that was the key point is became consistent. They right. used to have occasional, now yes, they just be yeah. consistently. Yeah, yeah. And that's because we've got these more sophisticated AI machine learning models where they can self-correct and learn from their mistakes. And so they, they're not just applying the rules. So yeah, really interesting. Good. Any other comments or questions? What about JD? What about just T, you know, questions about how, what it's like to study law or, you know, if you've got any, a lot of people are just put off and they think it's hard. I can tell you it's not hard. It really isn't. It's one of the easiest things you can do law. It's really because there's so much room, wiggle room, as they say, you can just, there isn't right and wrong things. As someone said, there really isn't a right and wrong answer. So if you've come from a situation like doing accounting where there's right and wrong, in law, you can justify a lot of things. There are certain things that are wrong, sure, but there's a lot of gray area. So it's actually not not that hard, especially not hard to pass. <laughs> to do well, yeah, it's hard, but yeah. Like if you're doing a job and you're doing it in the night, sort of, you know, it's not hard to pass because of that gray area. So it's not like accounting where you could just get it all wrong. <laughs> okay, so what I might do is I just want to talk a little bit about studying at Macquarie Law School. I mean, we I studied at Sydney, but I teach at Macquarie and I can say it's very friendly and we have so much time that we give to each student. It's a really different sort of thing. Um, but we do spend a lot of time building relationships. And this, our Dean wants you to see, is our new law school. 
uh, building which is coming and it's going to be like state of art and we're investing a lot of money in it so it is a really new environment and so on so that concludes my part um, and I'll hand you over to Andrew who's going to talk about the JD thank you so much for your time and thank you love seeing meeting you all and you know hearing all your views and seeing your poll results even if I didn't speak to you bye-bye I stop share Thank you, Nalifa. Um, I'm going to start sharing just one slide. Hope you can all see that. Yeah, I'm just going to talk very briefly um, about the Juris Doctor itself. Um, and Nalifa, do feel free to uh, to pop in at, at any moment if you have something you would like to add. Um, there's a lot of information on, on this slide about the Juris Doctor, but what I'm going to get straight to is the distinguishing features of Macquarie's Juris Doctor. So obviously the Juris Doctor um, is a law qualification, it's a postgraduate law for, uh, qualification. And what are the, well, should I might go to the career opportunities first. What can you become if you complete a Juris Doctor? Uh, you qualify to become a lawyer after you do the Juris Doctor and, and a bit of extra, uh, bit of extra study afterwards. Um, you can become a barrister or solicitor. But as uh, Nalifa mentioned earlier, it's not only those, um, those professions that, uh, lawyer, that lawyers move into or that qualified lawyers move into. It's a broad range of careers that law can set you up for uh, community legal centres, diplomatic service, financial institutions, multinationals, NGOs, advocacy bodies and public service. And they're just some of those. And they could be as a lawyer or could be using skills you learn within law um, in, a, in a job which maybe touches on law or maybe a job which even doesn't touch on law at all. Maybe you might um, move into a... Uh, a major consulting firm, um, but not as a lawyer, uh, just in a consultancy type of role, uh, but using your, your, your legal knowledge and the skills you develop during a law degree. Some of the distinguishing features of Macquarie's Juris Doctor, um, we offer flexible study. Now, the great majority of places where you can do a Juris Doctor will only offer on campus, but at Macquarie, we also offer online. So you can come to um, our campus at North Ride. It is a beautiful campus. It's very green and spacious. Um, and we're about to, uh, to start building a new law building. In fact, it, you may have seen it in the press in the last couple of days. Um, it's, uh, and it was on that slide that Nalifa had up just a moment ago. You can so we can come and study on, online. And a lot of our students do study online. Um, there is a pretty decent proportion who do study online. Um, and so if, if particularly if you're living outside of Sydney or if you're living um, on the far south of Sydney, you might find that it is easier um, to, to join us online and to study online. You can study full-time or part-time. We offer flipped learning, so you can listen to lectures at any time and use the class time, the smaller classes, for discussion and interaction. And that's one of the things we've tried to give a bit of a taste of uh, just here this evening as part of our masterclass. Um, in fact, we offer small class sizes. Um, so not only is that great for a discussion, for interaction, uh, but students get to know one another and not only do students get to know one another and socialize and, and develop friendships during the course itself during the three years full-time or longer part-time but students also get to keep up with one another after they've graduated so you graduate together or going out into the workforce together and uh, really encouraging and supporting one another um, as you as you start that that law career and Many of our students uh, who've graduated three or four years ago, they're still keeping up with their, their colleagues. Uh, there's opportunities uh, for meeting and engagement with our um, Macquarie University Law Society. Um, and that's not just for undergraduates, but it's also for postgraduates. And there's a postgraduate officer within the Macquarie University Law Society. And we encourage our law, law students to, uh, to engage with the Law Society. Um, again, it's, it's great uh, for many different reasons, for social reasons, but also for, um, for work um, and career reasons as well. And they do engage with, um, with, with law firms and, and bring them in um, to campus um, uh, during the course of the year. We also offer PACE. Now what PACE stands for is professional and community engagement. It provides a practical experience while studying. Now, a lot of, this is a unit, a credit uh, unit within the course. A lot of our students use this um, to, to uh, study in an, an internship or clerkship um, at, a, at a law firm. Um, you don't have to do that, um, but th there is that opportunity. Or indeed, um, 
work with one of the university's legal clinics in areas such as social justice. Some of our students will do this PACE unit with a, a law firm and then they'll, they'll go on to work with that law firm um, after they graduate. The, the firm gets an impression that they really like this person and they want them to, to join them after they, uh, they graduate. Um, the three requirements are down there. I won't talk through them, um, except to say that if you don't um, get offered a place in the jurist doctor, maybe your marks are just a bit shy of, of what we're re requiring. Um, we, we can make you an offer for the Graduate Certificate of Laws. And the Graduate Certificate of Laws is a four unit course. Um, if you complete that successfully, you can then articulate into the Juris Doctor. So if you don't get into the Juris Doctor first time, there is still the opportunity to do the Grad Cert and move into the Juris Doctor. Um, if you think that you're not gonna be quiet on that weighted average mark that it mentions there, even if you think you're gonna fall a bit short, we still encourage you to apply for the Juris Doctor. You can apply, uh, through UAC, um, you can see the web address there. Um, we still encourage you to apply for the Juris Doctor. If you don't quite make it, we'll just automatically make you an offer for Graduate Certificate of Laws from where, as, as I mentioned, you can articulate into the Juris Doctor. Um, the, the fees are there. You can see that common law supported places, we offer uh, some common law supported places. Um, they tend to be awarded to those with higher weighted average marks. I can't tell you exactly what weighted average mark you'll need um, to get a CSP place um, because that can vary from year to year. CSP places, those fees are, are set by the government. Um, if you're not successful for the CSP place, um, you can still join us on a, on a fee paying place. Um, so if you've got any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Either uh, myself or Nalifa will be uh, more than happy to answer you um, if you can. So yeah, please feel free to, to ask by the chat box or to ask um, again on, on screen. Good, thank you. I'm sorry I haven't gone through all the chat because I was so busy talking, I couldn't read it. So if you have any questions, I'm not sure whether there's any avenue, you, could, you can find me on uh, the internet and email me, my email address is there. Uh, I think Alex asked, what's my area of specialization? So I am a technology lawyer. Uh, I teach intellectual property as well, but my main interest is technology law um, and uh, I've been sort of teaching that for about 16 years. <laughs> Actually, um, Alex uh, had a question which is, uh, can you tell, please tell me about the pros and cons of, of distant learning? And in fact, Alex explains it as this new type of distant learning. Would you like to, um, to talk through that, Nalifa, please? Yeah, I mean, I think the main, the, the disadvantages of distant learning have really been narrowed because now a lot of the on-campus people also do a lot of um, what's online work. So for example, in the technology law, we have only, we have only um, online lectures. We don't have face-to-face -face lectures because the clear message from the internal students who are on campus is they still like their lectures online so they can listen to it on the train or whatever. So both the JD distance people and the on-campus people have the same experience from the lectures. What's different is that uh, the people who are in the internal on-campus, they have a weekly tutorial. So it does make a little bit, it's easier if you're not particularly organized or particularly motivated because you have to come every week, you have to do your reading and you have to, uh, you know, you're forced to do it. If you're a distance, you have to be much more motivated and do your work every week because you only meet on campus once in the whole of the semester. So you have to do your week and weekly work because if you leave it for the three days before your on-campus session, it'll be a disaster. So uh, and I think, you know, some people enjoy it not having to come every week. And then you could really do three weeks in one week. You have a busy time at work. You don't do anything for four weeks, you know, so you've got flexibility. Obviously the assignments, and there's two assignments usually for every semester, uh, they will be the same for the internal and the distance. So you have to organize yourself, but it gives a lot of flexibility. And there's always a weekly consultation sessions where you can come and meet your the convener, even if you're you know, a remote. And I have a lot of Zoom consultations with my JD students, uh, which I, almost as good, I wouldn't say as good, but you know, it's pretty good. It's better than a phone call. So um, that I think that it's, the gap has narrowed in terms of advantages and disadvantages. And it's, it's much more flexible for a lifestyle. So I, I think distance learning is equally as good as on campus. And in some cases could be better. Does that answer? 
Well, for law, I think it's important that you have chances to meet. Uh, I, I would personally would think, rightly or wrongly, that that not having opportunity to meet on a weekly basis would actually be detrimental for the learning you of can, law. You can I mean, that's my personal it. opinion. Yeah, because yeah. with the law, it's very specific. It's a case like yeah. you, you learn the law through case studies at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. reading the textbook and lectures, okay, but case, and that's where the weekly interaction I think is key, but yeah. just my personal opinion. So the JD program does have that weekly option as well. But uh, a lot of, as Andrew said, a lot of our students are distance and yeah, but there is an option if you want to come every week as well, yeah. Eddie does ask, uh, when is the online face-to-face -face if you are a distance learning student? Yeah, so it's in the middle of the semester usually. So there's what's called the mid-semester break. So the semester usually runs for 12 weeks of teaching. So you have six weeks and then you've got two weeks off and six weeks. So we usually have our on-campus session in that two week break. So what you're doing is, you know, you've read for six weeks and then you come and talk about it and that sort of prepares you for the next six weeks. So that's the way we've done lots of surveys and that's been the optimal, that's been the most popular timing. And people can plan ahead. So you have the dates at the beginning. So you take your two days of leave uh, or three, you know, whatever to come. Yeah. And, and um, I asked the question, is that compulsory? Very good question. It is compulsory unless you have a reason sort of are being unwell. Unfortunately, having a job and employment is not within our policy. So yeah, you do have to commit those two days. But if there is an emergency and family emergencies are covered with our special consideration policy, sickness, obviously, care or responsibilities, all of that. But having to go to work, unfortunately, isn't a, because they expect you to plan ahead. So, yeah, it's mandatory unless you've got we, we try our very best to accommodate that in you know, people within the university's policies and which our university is the same as every other university around the country. They have certain sort of minimum requirements yeah sure thanks yeah, thanks well if there's no more questions we might um call an end it's just approaching seven o'clock it's a minute before seven now so thank you very much to everybody for, for joining us uh, this evening we hope you found it very useful we hope you've uh, it's given you a taste of what uh, studying law was about and specifically studying a juris doctor a postgraduate course uh, thank you very much to Professor Nalifa um, Sabadurai for, for taking us through this really interesting topic and it's her particular area of expertise. Um, and yeah, we hope that maybe if you've got any questions, um, I've put Nalifa's email address in the chat. It's, um, it's, it's slowly getting further uh, along the chat as we get lots more comments. But uh, yeah, feel free to email uh, Nalifa uh, or to email future students at mq.edu.au if you have any questions about how to apply or just about particular course details. Yeah, so thank you once again, and we hope that you will join us um, again uh, next time, or maybe you might even join us um, in the Juris Doctor um, mm -hmm. session to this year or, or beyond. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.